The last things that I'll say before we get started, the Zoom captions are turned on. So to use those, just go down to the toolbar on the Zoom um, environment and choose either the closed caption button and then show subtitle or uh, some people, if your screen is minimized, you may need to use the more button with three dots to find that show subtitle option. And then because this is happening fast, there won't be time for questions, but we encourage them anyway. So use the chat to ask your questions as people are blazing through their amazing ideas. Hi, I'm Debbie. And I'm Sophie. And our 20 by 20 challenges ePortfolios users to reimagine the possibilities for ePortfolios. So aside from the typical uses like class projects, degree assessment, capstones, things like that, we want to encourage use for coordinating in teams. And when I was getting familiar with ePortfolios at the start, I didn't really know how to connect all of them and make sense of it. And I had the same problems. There was too much happening in one ePortfolio. So I had the bright idea of having multiple ePortfolios and using them like nesting dolls. So with our students, we use a particular framework where we talk about different orientations, purposes, and functions. When we say build an ePortfolio, we let them know it could be project-oriented, course-oriented, degree-oriented, professional, or personal. And so all of these different orientations can serve a lot of different purposes from managing projects and teams like the ePortfolio team does at IUPUI, supporting faculty and student learning with e instructional ePortfolios that I've created in the past, and also to just showcase work both that students and faculty and staff around campus alike are, um, are doing with ePortfolios. So we also noticed that there's different functions, and this comes from Abrami and Barrett 2005. People might use an ePortfolio more like a repository, a workspace, or a showcase. And when we talk to students, this logic resonates with them. They begin to see their projects, their courses, their semesters, their degrees, even their professional ambitions in these models where there are different orientations, they're nested, they're different persons, pers purposes and there's different functionality. Just ask Sophie. So this is an image of the digital poster that I'll be presenting in a session tomorrow actually, but it showcases all the different orientations of ePortfolios I've used and how they all connect at the core with like the big nesting doll, I guess, as the personal ePortfolio that serves as like the core that links out and like creates this web or nesting dolls of my ePortfolios. So you begin to see how all the high impact practices land in your ePortfolio as a meta high impact practice. And this gives students voice and choice and, and more control over their projects and what they're doing. When students see this, when they see these models, they get it. So look at Michael's, you know, he first did a project with a team with a community client. Then he had an internship. He loved ePortfolios so much, he used one for a presentation, and then he does one with his honors degree program. He transferred that into a digital humanities project where he's working with grassroots maternal child health initiatives. Amazing stuff that they do. And so the IUPUI ePortfolio team kind of has a motto, ePortfolio everything. And we really try to practice what we preach by having like this like filing cabinet ePortfolio that we use to document um, committee work, our team projects, things like that. And we're also trying to encourage and support faculty in their journey as they try to ePortfolio everything as well. So we're moving past this idea that there's one ePortfolio that a student's gonna manage all through college to the idea that they're bringing so many different things to the table from projects and courses to study abroad to undergraduate research programs, and then they can all be linked. And the student is in complete control the whole time. So we can begin to see people saying, this is just too much for me to do. But I would argue that in fact, the ePortfolio is a shortcut. It's a way to get past what you've done and put all of the things together in, in a functional way to track them. So students can then say, I have a connection between my course, my semester, my co-curriculars, my degrees, and the things I choose to pull out to share as part of a professional ePortfolio. And ePortfolios are really not just one size fits all situation here. So we would say that the ePortfolio option is the student's choice and it's just right. 
So let the students decide. This helps them focus more on context and content rather than trying to pack everything into one spot. So they can focus on a particular project they're doing rather than trying to get um, it and develop it in a portfolio like Jada did with a team project for IU School of Medicine. And that ended up being a completely different um, website management than she did with a professional writing skills course. So when she goes to share this and showcase it, she's linking to one particular URL to share on our showcase. So she's not linking to a homepage for the showcase, she's linking to a project. In this way, students can share lots of different individual pieces in a larger repository that's searchable. So they're showcasing much of their work instead of one singular piece. They are in control, they're sharing what they wanna share, they're sharing it the way they wanna share it, and because we've done this, we're able to um, better support and advocate for project-based learning, for internships, and for these very specific enriching experiences to be shared in our IEL Engage Learning Showcase. Um, our students are just now figuring it out, and it's working. And so how do these e-portfolios that these students are showcasing differ from regular websites? It's a great question. Uh, I hear it all the time from students um, and faculty sometimes as well, and they are websites, but you focus a lot more on that reflection and what you context contextualize for that reflection, such as the artifacts you're providing, that's what makes it an e-portfolio. And nesting invites students to build more than just the one e-portfolio. So we'd say no one can build just one. And thank you so much for your time today. Fantastic, and made it with 15 seconds left to go. All right, well, um, again, questions and comments in the chat as we get ready for our next 20 by 20. Welcome. We, that is Megan, Morgan, Sarah, and I, Christina, are going to share first results from one of the projects that the ABLE Digital Ethics Task Force ran this year in the world premiere right here at ABLE 2023. So get ready. The four of us are here today on behalf of the entire Digital Ethics Task Force that has worked together since September last year and just finished its work at the beginning of the Northern Hemispheric summer break. The task force itself started back in 2019, making this our fourth year. In year four, we selected three primary areas to focus on, each led by one of our co-chairs. Development focused on further developing the principles that we started several years ago. Outreach focused on sharing those as broadly and widely as possible. And research focused on doing research based on the principles, one of which we're going to focus on today. That's our visibility of labor principle, which reads the labor required by students, educators, and administrators to create, develop, implement, support, and evaluate e-portfolios should be visible, sustainable, compensated where appropriate, and counted toward evaluation and advancement. The Digital Ethics and ePortfolios Task Force seeks to put the principles into practice, starting with the visibility of labor principle. Inspired by the International wac wid Mapping Project and the National Census of Writing, the task force aims to capture and value the often overlooked or fleeting aspects of ePortfolio labor. Our goal is to comprehensively map and understand the field of ePortfolio work in higher education across the U.S. and Canada so far, 62 people have participated in the survey, representing a range of higher education institutions. The majority, 48.4% of respondents, come from institutions known for their extensive research activity. Response to our question about the length of experience working with portfolios shows the growth and impact of e-portfolios over time, as 22 respondents report being relatively new, zero to three years, but 18 respondents have been using ePortfolios for eight years or more. A majority of respondents' primary role working with ePortfolio is that of instructor, followed by instructional support, program directors, assessment support, and generalized advocate role. Advocates often function as liaisons trying to establish how and where e-portfolios may be used. As our respondents note, however, a big concern continues to be the contested space e-portfolios occupy, 
describing an overarching lack of agreed upon best practices, how to support students, what e-portfolios should do, and how to assess them. But despite this contested space, most respondents agree that e-portfolios are widely used for reflection, integrative learning, assessment, employability, and multimedia or multimodal composing. In terms of the places that e-portfolios get used, these were the top five that respondents reported using at their institution. 41 noted that e-portfolios are used in individual classes and 30 identified general education. In addition to these, other notable uses included graduate and professional programs and career services. As one respondent noted, e-portfolios have largely been adopted in experiential learning programs so far. This tracks with our larger findings about the popularity of e-portfolios in professional programs and career service centers. Another important element of our survey was identifying what kind of support institutions offer for e-portfolio and where that support is housed. As our principal highlights, Recognizing the labor required to do e-portfolios well is critical to their success. Thus far, we've found that centers for teaching and learning are the primary collaborators where they exist. Those are followed by technology support and writing centers. Many respondents also indicated that they collaborate within their individual departments and with their institutional assessment and research offices. A key question our survey asks how e-portfolio work is valued at different institutions. One respondent captures the essence of how e-portfolios are valued across institutions, stating that universities communicate how much they value e-portfolios with the way they fund support for that work. Unfortunately, a majority of respondents, 37, still feel that their e-portfolio endeavors are not acknowledged at all or others see them as just minimally so, with small awards, few course releases, limited stipends, and in some cases, credit towards tenure and promotion. We are actively gathering insights on individuals' experiences related to ePortfolio design, implementation, and support. We encourage you to share your own experiences with us, which should only ask approximately 20 minutes of your time. We also invite you to join us tomorrow for the session titled Mapping ePortfolio Labor, Insights from a Year-Long North American Survey. During this session, we will present our initial analyses based on the information provided by participants. We will specifically examine the labor involved from the perspectives of care work and third space practitioners. During our work, we acknowledged early on that we can't have one survey for the entire world. Therefore, we are having regional ones, which are to a degree, of course, dependent on the task force members. That's why our second region is Australia and Aotearoa, New Zealand. If you're from my part of the world, please participate and have your say. You can also join us in year five and learn more about digital ethics in ePortfolios, be part of our working groups and support the efforts in general to make digital ethics an integral part of ePortfolio practice. If you are interested, there is a short application form that we ask you to fill in by the 15th of September. Thank you, everybody. You and a comment in the chat appropriate, uh, making your labor about the visibility of labor visible. So it's a meta comment. Love it. All right. Um, Christina, I'm going to ask for your help in determining who's next because it seems you have a better understanding of the order than I do. Okay, sure. Let me check. So next would be Abby Crew from Colorado Mountain College on enhancing authentic assessment through ePortfolios at a dual mission institution. And just as an outlook after that, Krista from Bucknell University, please get ready. Perfect. Over and I've you. got my timer ready for you, Abby, whenever you're ready to start. Thank you. I am joined by my colleague, Carla Hardesty, who will be sharing her screen. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us to enhance authentic assessment through ePortfolio at a dual mission institution. Uh, 
alongside Abby, I'm uh, Carla Hardesty, the Interim Dean of Academic Support at Colorado Mountain College. And I'm Abby Crew, the Assistant Dean of Academic Planning, Assessment and Improvement, Curriculum Review and Innovation. This does not appear to be auto advancing. There it goes. Here is an example of undergraduate student research embedded in, in an e-portfolio. Having this type of signature work in the e-portfolio allows for authentic assessment of our outcomes, especially in our institutional outcomes, which we'll describe in this presentation. We'll be sharing several examples of students' work with students' names redacted. In 2022-23, a college-wide interdisciplinary task force re-envisioned our institutional student learning outcomes to better align our new role as a dual mission Hispanic serving institution. After examining research and gathering input across the college and former employers, um, alumni, and students, we developed this framework with outcomes of knowledge, involvement, and application. Um, we wanted our ISLOs to be relevant prevalent and measurable. This poster of a student research project shows how we can live and breathe our ISLOs. It's an authentic assessment that demonstrates the various competencies of our knowledge, involvement, and application outcomes, such as problem solving and critical thinking. Our ISLOs are assessed at the course, co-curricular, program, and institutional levels. An e-portfolio with authentic assessments can help us pull this together at all levels. We're piloting an e-portfolio platform with templates in which we can assess our ISLOs across all this through reflection. Um, we've adopted high impact practices to align our institutional student learning outcomes. This poster of student research is an example of these at play with the high impact practices with particular integration of our competencies such as integrative learning and problem solving. This research is an example of authentic assessment that fits into our institutional assessment cycle. And here's a diagram of the cycle of assessment of student learning with corresponding reflective questions for reporting by faculty. We capture the assessment methods, that bottom right piece, through artifacts and reflections displayed in student e-portfolios. Then through our e-portfolio platform, faculty can analyze these authentic assessments and student reflections in their assessment work. And this is a student artifact that's a direct result of iterative improvements made by faculty who engaged in their reflective practice inspired by the new assessment process to create this rich high impact practice student artifact. Our COMPASS initiative is our student retention and success strategy that bridges student affairs and academic affairs and is comprised of three overlapping circles, guided pathways, high impact practices and gen ed courses, and holistic advising. The reflective CMC experience overlays all of the task forces and is captured by ePortfolio to celebrate, demonstrate, and assess our institutional student learning outcomes. This is another student artifact that captures the reflective CMC experience celebrating the student's knowledge, involvement, and application obtained through their student journey. This logic model outlines the goals of ePortfolio for our institution as well as how to get there. Ultimately, our vision for change is to be able to capture, demonstrate, and celebrate the CMC experience embedded with institutional student learning outcomes, creating workforce-ready students and lifelong learners. How we get there is outlined from our inputs, et cetera. Finally, uh, this is another student artifact that highlights their reflection on who they are, their educational journey, and their professional goals. It's a program-level e-portfolio in our act outdoor recreation and leadership program. Oops. As we mentioned earlier, we're piloting an e-portfolio platform to practice reflection with students and faculty, ensure students can articulate their learning, integrate their knowledge and document their growth. And we also want this as a useful tool for assessment aligned with our ISLOs across curricular and co-curricular experiences. We're entering our second year with the ePortfolio pilot. The student research project here was shared at our inaugural student symposium and captured reflective data from the student as a high impact practice from their research. So just another example of an authentic assessment with students, and this one has the reflection built into it as well. 
Here you can see our template with the institutional student learning outcomes, which allows for measurable assessment with our student our student learning assessment committee of knowledge, involvement, and application overlaid with the AAC and U rubrics in the CORA build of Digication. This is another example of a student artifact. It's a course level student artifact that celebrates and demonstrates the rich work of students in our ecosystem science program, uh, specifically in their genetics courses. We participated in the AACNU General Education Institute with faculty and deans who were not involved with our ePortfolio work. And our outcome from that institute, excitingly, was that they are now champions for ePortfolio. And we can now leverage the robustness of ePortfolio to demonstrate integrative learning across the curriculum and the institutional learning outcomes, especially through authentic assessment. Finally, one more student artifact that demonstrates knowledge, the knowledge students obtained in their sustainability course, their involvement in their local community, and the application of their learning and sharing out as part of the inaugural student symposium. So you can see across the curriculum, we have integrated and demonstrated the institutional student learning outcomes. We're on track with our next steps in our compass, that Venn diagram that Abby just discussed, and we'll strengthen each of these steps in the next year from continued adoption of ePortfolio across curricular and co-curricular programs with the integration of assessment and our updated ISLOs, all leading to, there on the right, student readiness. And then we conclude with an example of student readiness and authentic assessment that fits into student ePortfolios. One of these students in this photo here presented at our inaugural student symposium, but this group of student researchers presented at a national conference. Uh, these types of experiences are really what this work in ePortfolio and assessment is all about. So thanks for joining us and email us if you have any questions or comments. Thank you. Wow, thank you, uh, Colorado, Colorado Mountain College crew. And <laughs> no pun intended with your last name, Abby. Um, and now I believe Christina is the next one. Krista Matlack from Bucknell. Yep. Perfect. All right. Well, then um, you let me know when you're ready to start, and then I will start. Yep. I have them set to auto advance after 20 seconds. Oh, so perfect. Hopefully that works. Hi, I'm Krista Matlack. I'm a career coach at the Center for Career Advancement at Bucknell University, and I'm here to present on behalf of my CCA colleagues. To start, Bucknell is a small liberal arts institution in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, with approximately 3,700 undergraduates and 30 graduate students across three colleges, the College of Arts and Sciences, College of Engineering, and the Freeman College of Management. In alignment with other career centers across higher education, one mission of the CCA is to really educate students on the importance of building a foundation of skills using a framework of core competencies provided to us by the National Association of Colleges and Employers um, in order to prepare them for lifelong success in the workplace. So career services in higher education has really undergone major changes since technological advancements have led to the development of interactive job engines like Handshake. In addition to engaging in accessible learning modules, um, many departments are shifting to a career everywhere approach in an effort to scale up their services and reach more students. At Bucknell, the CCA has developed a strategic plan to scale up their services using a one-to-many approach, which included a number of changes in our departmental operations, resources, and services. The focus today is on the addition of our in-person four-credit courses that we launched in the fall semester of 2022. Initially, we launched the two pre-health courses and a general career readiness course, um, but we will be expanding our offerings to include two pre-law courses in the 2023-2024 academic year. Uh, this presentation is gonna highlight UNIV 175, which was designed with first and second year students in mind. Our goal was really to provide an opportunity for students across all the colleges to learn the basics of career decision-making, professional etiquette, and the hiring process, while primarily geared towards the first years and sophomores, there were seats available to juniors and seniors. We filled 158 of the 200 possible seats through promotion to mentors and advisors of underrepresented groups, associate deans, parents, and even our Instagram followers. 
we enrolled students um, and they had a seven week crash course in a variety of topics from self-awareness to negotiating job offers. And at the end of the course, our hope was really that the students understood how their personal interests and values play a role in finding meaningful employment and really how to navigate the hiring process in a variety of industries. UNIV 175 was built around the creation of a learning e-portfolio that encourages the students to connect the course material with their own personal interests and experiences as they begin to develop their personal narrative for their unique career journey. And the next few slides are gonna highlight some of the activities from our template and our example e-portfolio. The template was organized by the course content and each page incorporated reflective prompts, um, activities or assignments from the fall semester to, um, to the spring semester, we added prompt modules to um, incorporate an ease of use for the students. And on the first day of class, we asked them to review the syllabus and course materials and write uh, what they wanted to learn in the course. The following week, we shifted our attention to self-awareness, which was grounded in reading such as you majored in what and designing your life and activities such as the true colors assessment. The students were then asked to draw connections between the course material and their major of choice or their major of interest and potential careers. And that reflection also required an artifact. Um, some From self-awareness, we went to career exploration where they inventoried their personal values, explored career interests on ONET and participated in discussions um, based on career advice provided by Bucknell alum. And again, they needed to reflect on the course content, what they learned and provide media to support their reflection. Networking was broken into two sections. Section one focused on informational interviewing, which was the most challenging yet rewarding assignment for the students because they had to step outside their comfort zone to really complete the interview. And the second section, the students developed their elevator pitch and created or updated a LinkedIn profile. The students then practiced a targeted search strategy and selected opportunities that fit their individual interests. We encourage the students to use a variety of resources to help expand their toolkit beyond just Handshake, LinkedIn, and things like Indeed. Our initial assignment was a little bit complicated in Microsoft Word. Um, so moving forward, we actually reconfigured to built-in prompts. The career tools section um, included creating and updating a resume and a cover letter using supplementary resources such as samples and learning modules. These assignments used an ungrading technique in which the students submitted their first draft, received feedback from the instructor, and then submitted their final draft for their grade. The students then wrapped up the course by sharpening their interviewing skills on big interview and reflecting upon their experience. The instructors really coach the students not only the importance of using the STAR method to construct their strong responses, but also to improve their confidence, tone, preparation, and etiquette. The course content really built upon each other and it culminated with a final reflection that asked the students to review that very first reflection to see if they met their learning goals and to consider how they can use what they learned from this course in the next six to 12 months. And on the final day of class, we asked the students to complete a three minute presentation highlighting just one element of their e-portfolio that was most impactful to them. The grading rubric for our, our learning e-portfolio consisted of these six areas, provided students a lot of flexibility in the design and organization. Um, and instructors really encouraged the students to use this opportunity to develop a visual appearance that aligns with the professional digital identity that they began to develop in this course. And since we built this course and the ePortfolio from the ground up, we knew there was going to be modifications to the course content, structure, and delivery. So the feedback on the screen here was collected from course evaluations throughout the 2022-2023 academic year. And then heading into year two, we have already made some adjust adjustments. We're planning to have a 14-week course option to increase the accessibility and inclusivity add structured labs to help the students become more equated with digication, and hopefully move our course material from Moodle to digication pending um, the new Quora course update. And then in addition to the constructive criticism, many students commented on how this course met and exceeded their expectations when it came to the learning objectives. As career professionals and instructors, we're thrilled at the impact the course has made on our students, and we're excited to jumpstart year two. Thank you guys. Excellent. Kia ora. My topic today is Decadip, how and why 
to repurpose your content 10 times or more. And it came about thanks to a conversation I had with Amy Ticchino and Christine Slade in one of our ABLE Digital Ethics Task Force meetings. Because at that time, we lamented that there's never really enough time and somehow we got to talk about sharing time-saving ways to do our work, which of course is for the most part, in our case, e-portfolio related. And I thought it might be a good idea to uh, share some of these tips in this short 2020. On the one hand, we have a lot of demands on our time on a daily basis. On the other hand, we all know um, of time-saving ways, but may not always recognize them in our day-to-day -day work. So that's where I'd like to share some things from my practice with you. We've all heard it before, work smarter, not harder. That'll help us not to drop the ball, or in my case, the strawberry, because it's way too delicious to sacrifice to a time sunk. So today I'll be sharing 10 tips with you, hence the Deca dip that Amy coined to help you recognize some of these smarter ways. Because imagine a time when you don't have to start from scratch for everything again, but can focus on one thing and get not just one or two or even five additional benefits out of it, but a whooping 10 or more. Wouldn't that be amazing? Can you already see yourself enjoying the extra free time you'll have? You may have noticed that I dipped a bit into the language of social media sensationalism, and thus will use an example from my own experience to illustrate my points. It's my absolutely free, no credit card needed podcast, create, share, engage. So where do we start? Well, like any good portfolio story, we start with the evidence or the artifact. In my case, that's the individual podcast episode that I record at random times and then publish every other Wednesday, New Zealand time, Tuesday for those of you in the Americas. So let's start with the decadips. Decadip one, it's important that you find the best way for you to reach your goals. What works for your colleague may be inherently wrong for you and be a drag. After lots of trial and error, I found what works for me right now, and that is to have conversations with others. Decadip two, I'm not only having these conversations to have a chat, but I'm having these conversations to learn from people, how they are approaching portfolio work, what cool projects they are doing or research exploring, and thus I can expand my own horizon. Decadip three, those conversations and what I learn influence how I regard my own practice, what I know about the field, what I want to explore further, and what I want to trial myself. Right now, AI, of course, is a hot topic, and I just finished recording two amazing interviews. Decadip four. So far, kind of everything has been just for me, but really, I'm having conversations so I can share what the members in our community do with others like you, no matter whether you're on the top left corner of my screen, in the middle, or on the second page, or listen to the recording of this presentation. Decadip five. But I don't just want to make the audio available, since not everybody may be able to access it. Therefore, I'm including a transcript for people who prefer to read or rely on it and want to copy sections. In my podcast case, it actually also helps with search engine optimization, giving me Decadip 5.5. Decadip 6. A 20 or 40 minute interview may not be everybody's fruit. So I provide visualizations to interest people to think at least about a particular aspect. Since I've already done the transcript, it's not much more work to copy quotes into a graphic. Decadip 7. This is a tip that, admittedly, I've not done yet, but wanted to include because it's been one I've been thinking about a lot. I can transform an interview into a written case study that is then published with permission, of course, but I might want to ask a colleague to do that for me. Decadip 8. I've done 27 interviews since last August and am like a gatherer who collects all the things. I can now explore patterns, aggregate data since I'm asking the same three questions of everybody's seed trends and build on the corpus or rather the data set. And that is all being preserved because Decadip 9 
as like I'm also feeling like an like I'm acting as an oral history documentarian who collects the voices from the community to preserve them to ensure we capture all their stories as they are all amazing to collect and share. Decadip 10. By doing this work, I can connect people, form networks, and contribute to the wider goal of our community to support each other. Additionally, interviewers can use their own interviews as evidence of their learning and sharing of their research, work, and practice. So there are bound to be other things that you can do with one single artifact. So find simple ways of how to get 10 benefits out of one thing to make your work more efficient, streamlined, and fun so you can see how your work survives and generates values for weeks, months, and maybe even years to come. Now over to you. What's your strawberry? What's your starting evidence or artifact that you can repurpose once, twice, three times, or even more? Take a minute to think about what has given you a lot of joy and what you could do to prolong that joy. By reflecting on that, you are well on your way to find your personal decadip and can explore to reuse, remix, and recycle your content, making the most out of it for you and maybe even others, so you too work smarter, not harder, but most importantly, more energized and happier. Thank you. Wow. Um, and you did 20 by 20 with the number 10, so you had like all these multiples. Uh, I do think we now have the IUPUI yep. group. Yes, that's correct, Kevin. And then last but not least is Cindy, who was pre-poning her presentation from the, from the in-person one. Great, well, thank you. Rachel and I are excited to be here. Uh, Rachel's gonna be advancing the slides. We're gonna be talking about the impact of academic advising on ePortfolios as a touch point. Wanted to give you just a little context of our university. It's an urban university. We're in downtown Indianapolis. We have about 20,000 undergraduate students, 17 degree granting schools. And then also we wanted to introduce our team. So Rachel and I are part of the team. Rachel's our team lead. And we also have Mark Hertel, who you might have heard earlier today. He's our department chair. And then Steve Fallafield is another faculty member on our team. Having our department chair as part of our team has been very helpful in the process. We wanted to give you a little bit of context for our department of kinesiology. So the mission of our department is to provide a diverse student body with engaging, service-focused, and practical activities informed by evidence-based and scholarly research. We have our culture in our department. We're very student-centered and community-focused with many community collaborations. We also feel that professional development is important, and we're really dedicated to our students. In our curriculum, um, in the Department of Kinesiology, we value high impact practices. We have nine embedded high impact practices in the, throughout the curriculum, starting in the first year seminar um, and in courses all throughout as they go through the program, all the way up through the capstone experience. In our department, we have three different majors. We have an exercise science major, a fitness management and personal training major and a physical education teacher education major. 100% um, of our students have some type of real world internship experience or student teaching. Many of our exercise science students go on to further their education. And we are actually the oldest physical education program in the nation. Little bit of background, some of you might have seen some of our other presentations where we talk about all of the things we did wrong when we first started. We've actually published an article, but we've, we started rough, but we've definitely learned a lot, learned things not to do. And we're happy to um, talk to you at any time to hopefully you, so you can avoid some of the pitfalls that we fell into. Some of the lessons we learned, we started off very product focused with our ePortfolios and that just didn't work out well for us. So we really shifted to much more of a process focus where it's the students becoming reflective practitioners through that through doing the ePortfolio, having it not be a standalone assignment, but really be integrated into the curriculum of the courses that it's, it's linked to. Um, we had a lack of planning and assessment, and then we also lacked peer review in the process of developing e-portfolios. So our, our current strategy, strategy, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Rachel. 
Our current strategy um, is we are doing reflective e-portfolios and the purpose is to teach students the importance of and instill the skills for becoming a reflective practitioner in the future. Um, any career in the health and, and uh, physical education field is always ever evolving. So instilling that importance of personal growth and reflection even on into your career. Our ongoing problem, um, we have two, one, is right here, student buy-in engagement and ownership. The other one is faculty buy-in, which we still struggle with today. Uh, but we participated in the AACNU Institute in 2011. And one of the um, projects that we did was introducing e-portfolios into academic advising. So you can see here where our touch points were. We had nothing in the sophomore year and we knew our advisor, met with each student the sophomore year it was required. Um, so during that advising meeting, they talk with students about their degree progress. Uh, they talk about post-graduation plans. And if time allows, they review the e-portfolio. Uh, so all students are required to meet with an advisor that sophomore year. But now our advisors actually talk about the e-portfolio in every single um, meeting with students. So examples of kind of the dialogue that happens during that. Um, the advisor will say, this is your reminder that you've created an e-portfolio to capture your experiences and reflect on what they mean. Oftentimes they haven't looked at it since freshman year. So they'll ask them to go back and look at it, see what's the same, what's different, and how can they update their e-portfolio to reflect where they are right now. Um, so it gets a new audience on it. Um, after the advising appointment, the students do reserve, receive a survey, although um, completion of the survey is very low, uh, but they have two questions about the e-portfolio, one quantitative asking about whether or not they understand the purpose, and then the other one is asking them kind of a future, how do they plan to engage over the next year? And these are just two examples of student responses on that qualitative question. Um, I plan to continue updating my e-portfolio throughout the next year and part of the life health science internship, and I've been updating my e-portfolio through that as well. So kind of making connections, they're using their e-portfolio beyond their courses in another internship. And then another student said, I will try to be more involved, uh, try to be in, involved as much as I can to be able to continue to add to my e-portfolio. So kind of thought to them, how can they get even more involved? The biggest challenge that we are facing is turnover in our academic advising unit. We've had nearly 100% turnover. So we have one um, advisor. Otherwise, the six others have turned over in the last year. Um, so continuous training is a little bit challenging, but that head advisor is on our side. She's on our team. Um, she's actually participating in the AACNU Institute right now with another team within our school. And she is helping a little bit, and I'll share that in a minute. So in sum, the advising touch point has been effective, yet it's a little bit challenging. Um, so next steps, we have realized that this is going to be a great place to capture our transfer students. We have a lot of students that transfer into our college or from another major to our major. Uh, the advisor, this is where I said I was going to share, she created a one-page tip sheet that actually goes out in an email to students, and she created um, top 10 things that should be in an e-portfolio. It was super amazing to, to see her take that initiative and do that. And then they're currently training our peer student ambassadors who are student employees that work in the advising office that can sit down one-on-one -on -one and work with our students on their e-portfolio, specifically those transfer students. Thank you. <laughs> that is it. Wow, oh, and I think we have just enough time in our slot for the last but not least, Cindy Stevens from Wentworth Institute of Technology. Cindy, take it away. Hi, hopefully everybody can see my screen. I'm going to leave it minimized because it was crashing my computer earlier to make it larger. So I'm Cindy Stevens. Um, my presentation is on digital self-identity. This is part B. I, I presented last year on part A, and this is about five additional skills needed for 2025 and beyond. I am a professor at Wentworth Institute of Technology in Boston, right in the heart of the city, although I'm going to be moving to Florida in two weeks, but I will be working remote, which is incredible. Uh, this presentation is about assessment of student work, lifelong learning, 
Um, the last presentation that I did last year was on the top 10 skills needed for 2025 and beyond related to um, e-portfolio assessment. I also, with this presentation, this again, this is looking at the next five because there's actually 15. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail. I did a little bit of research, did a little bit of curriculum review, and um, started piecing some of this together related to the top 15 skills uh, that the World Economic Forum says that you need for 2025 and beyond for students. Uh, and our business management students, as some of you have seen presentations in the past, we do have a required e-portfolio. The areas that are required to be um, included in your portfolio is research, writing, group dynamics, leadership, professional development, and communication, although they are allowed to add hobbies and outside things as well. So um, they pretty much develop a pretty well-rounded e-portfolio. So again, last year I presented on the top 10 skills for the World Economic Forum, and I was able to um, assess student portfolios to try to detect those top 10 skills. I won't go into each and every one of these, but these are the uh, definitions that the World Economic Forum describes uh, that these students, ne they need to have for skills base for 2025 and beyond. Analytical thinking, complex problem solving, everything you already know in this room. I also was able to uh, cross-reference those to Whiting's research where she has narrowed hers down to four areas, problem solving, self-management, working with people, technology use and development. So I was able to uh, reference those and cross matrix reference those to the top 10 areas that the World Economic Forum um, presents. But there's actually 15. So last year I did not wanna go into the top 15 because that seemed like a bit much. And these last five are to me higher level um, skills that the World Economic Forum is indicating that students need for 2025 and beyond. And I, um, emotional intelligence, persuasion and negotiation, systems analysis, troubleshooting, and service orientation. And when I went into this, I uh, did not think I would be able to detect any of these skills in our student e-portfolios, but I was quite surprised, and I'll go into that next. I also did a little short literature review. If anybody's interested in reading more about that, you can look at um, the edition of AEPR that was published at the beginning of last year. And um, all of these um, authors here, these researchers here, they express these skills in a little bit of a different manner. So I just wanted to see what others were saying about um, these types of skills that are gonna be needed. One, a couple of the ones that really stood out to me um, above uh, the World Economic Forum is active listening, actual visual appearance and arguing. Those, those really stood out to me the most, but um, you could take a look at my research and the article published from last year. So I was able to connect these skills and also the research that I discovered from these authors to Whiting's research so that I could get these narrowed down into these four areas. If you haven't noticed, I'm a process systems thinker so that's how I like to evaluate e-portfolios. So, um, you know, problem solving, the researchers are saying things like arguing, re reasoning, conflict resolution, self-management skills. The researchers are thing saying things like expressing and regulating emotion, visual appearance. So um, I was able to plop those into Whiting's areas as well. Then I researched, I mean, I assessed our top four student e-portfolio winners. We issue prize money. Um, for e-portfolios to get some um, productivity going out of these students. So I took a look at Kento's and uh, um, Mohammed's e-portfolio and um, Kento's and Yanni's e-portfolio. These are our top four prize winners. And you can actually get to their e-portfolios through the article. The links are there. I, I'm only showing one matrix assessment here just for time's sake, but I was pleasantly surprised that I was able to detect all of these, all of these, every one of them, all five of these skills in their e-portfolios. And what's interesting is we do not set out to teach the top 15 World Economic Forum skills. We don't do that. Matter of fact, I'm a lone ranger when it comes to e-portfolios at our school. Uh, I keep this going year after year after year, thankfully, because I'm a member of ABLE and, you know, the e AEPR journal, so I keep this momentum going, but I was pleasantly surprised that I was able to detect these skills in all four of those e-portfolios, and 
if I'm detecting it in these students, I can detect it in all about all 100 of our graduates because they have to work on the same projects and research and things like that. So just a few direct examples, you know, Kentor served as a ramp mentor. It has, it's related to a food and security program. So that sort of let me know that, you know, he's, he's involved with problem solving and he's working with people. And um, Evan, he has a, a family restaurant. So he's constantly having to do things like solve problems and negotiate customer complaints. So reflecting all that information in his e-portfolio e let me know that he's really pretty good at expressing and regulating emotions. Uh, Yanni is actually an Apple specialist in the product zone. So um, that tells me and it would tell any employer in my mind that he has great listening skills, which is not something that a lot of students are, or even us sometimes have the ability to do. So that's very well representative. So, and I'll, I believe all four of these students, probably all of our management students will be able to show that they're self-reflecting because they're reflecting on their e-portfolios. So just a few um, slides just to wrap up. I think that um, in my mind, the World Economic Forum definitions need to be expanded a little bit more after all the research I conducted. And I do feel confident that we are teaching our students what they need to learn and grow for these 15 world economic skills, which was very exciting to find that out. Doesn't hurt us to keep um, assessing our curriculum and maybe looking at um, adding some direct KPI measurements to make sure we are um, looking at these top 15 skills. The larger picture, you know, do we need to develop some rubrics? Do we need to, again, develop those KPIs? And should there be other research reviewers looking at these e-portfolios and not just me? Am I biased? Am I seeing things that I don't think I'm seeing? So that's something to take a look at. And then a few other things. I think that um, if there's any areas that we're sort of lacking, I think the systems thinking and troubleshooting area for these skills need to um, be beefed up a little bit. Um, although they are meeting all of those areas, I think there was a little bit of lacking in those. And then for future research, I really want to look at behaviorist and cognitive and constructionist learning opportunities. So that is my presentation, and I really hope you enjoyed it. Thank you. Fantastic. And I think we all should give the entire 20 by 20 crew a round of applause. That is no easy task to fit that many ideas and words into such a short time.